You're listening to the Fresh Hell Podcast. Fresh Hell contains stories of a disturbing and often graphic nature and is intended for a mature audience. Please don't let your kids listen to this, or they might turn out like us. Hi, I'm Annie from the United States. And I'm Johanna from Austria. Thank you for joining us for another episode of your favorite international podcast. If you're new, Annie and I are online friends who live on two different continents and never met in real life. Yet. That's right. And if you're one of our regular listeners, welcome back. Also, we want to send a shout out to our newest Patreon supporters, who are Jin Walker. Hi, Jin. I am obsessed with that girl's skin. And her hair. And yeah, the whole thing. Jin, are you a model? You should be a model of just anything. I'll buy it. <laughs> Deanna White. That's a cool name, too, Deanna. Kathleen. Kathleen, that is a solid Irish Catholic girl. Are you? A lot of Kathleen's in my family. Jennifer Lee. Thank you. Rachel Southam. Hello. Gabrielle Podvoiskis. Gabrielle, now you need to tell us how wrong we were, but that's a another fantastic name. And Stephanie Lipka. Hi, Steph. Hi. Naughty, naughty girl. It's, we're <laughs> real life friends with Steph. That's awkward. I mean, listen, we'll still take your money, though. Thank you very much <laughs> to everyone for your support. We sincerely mean that. Yes, we are so grateful for all of our listeners. You all support us in so many different ways, and we wouldn't still be doing this podcast without you. True story. Okay, <laughs> so hopefully you've already listened to last week's episode. This is part two of our discussion of the Madeleine McCann case. And we want to remind you that these two episodes are not a super comprehensive retelling of the entire case. It's much too detailed for a two-part podcast. So please keep that in mind. Uh, last week we discussed the disappearance of Madeline and today we're going to discuss a pathetic excuse for a human being, the suspect that German police feel is responsible for her fate, uh, his criminal history and what our thoughts were in this case. All right, so we're going to start with a super quick recap for those who did listen last week, but like me, have a terrible memory. So three, almost four-year-old Madeline McCann, she was on spring holiday from the UK with her parents, her two-year-old twin siblings, and three other families at the Ocean Club in Praia de Luz, Portugal. She went missing there from the bedroom she was sharing with her two younger siblings in an unlocked apartment down the road from where her parents were having dinner. The scene at the resort was never properly contained. It was a total 1800s crime scenario, you know, shit show. People just all in and out of the place and searching everywhere led to so many people and also dogs contaminating the scene. It's not till months later and after cleanings and other tenants are in before proper sniffer dogs are brought over from the UK to search the apartment at the Ocean Club and the car that McCann's rented three weeks after Madeline disappeared. They took a lot of samples based on where the dogs had hit, but with the evidence that they were able to collect, they don't have a single complete DNA profile of Madeline in the apartment or the car. And on 6th of September, Portuguese police have Kate in for a long interview as a witness. And the next day, so September 7th, Portuguese detectives make the couple official suspects or arguidos. They are allowed to fly home to England with the twins two days later, though. Jerry said, quote, We want the twins as much as is reasonably possible to live an ordinary life in their home country and want to consider the events of the last few days, which have been so deeply disturbing. Despite there being so much we wish to say, we are unable to do so, except to say this. We played no part in the, dis in the disappearance of our lovely daughter, Madeline, end quote. And we touched on this last week, but about a month later, Detective Amaral, the detective in charge of the Portuguese inquiry, was removed from the case after he gave an interview criticizing the British police. We could do a 10-parter on the mistakes made by all of the police and investigators from all over the world on this case, but we are focusing on Maddie and what may have happened to her. Yeah, and I think also, please correct me if I'm misremembering, but I believe that when Madeline went missing, there was not a second offender registry in Portugal, and the United Kingdom did not have an equivalent to the Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Um, that was established in the United States in 1984. Sorry, it says, my note says 1884, and I was like, mm, no. <laughs> 
children were still very much missing and exploited on the regular in 1884. 1984 is when the uh, Center for Missing and Exploited Children was established, and that was set up in part by Adam Walsh's parents. I think Mm. that might have been in the Netflix doc, maybe, more about that center and the work they do. Okay, so the McCanns do some traveling and hold press conferences trying to get their daughter's image in the news. They go to Germany, which is another country where Praia da Luz is a popular tourist destination. They go back to the Netherlands, to Amsterdam, where they've been living when Madeline was born. So the McCanns move back to the UK when Kate was pregnant with the twins and Madeline was one. The McCanns are increasingly being looked at as suspicious, but also it's important to remember that historically and statistically speaking, family is involved with the disappearance of a child likely in a contentious custody scenario. Non-familial abductions make up less than 1% of missing children. The largest percentage number are runaways, so in that case children who are fleeing an untenable home life or are suffering from mental illness. That November, Jerry speaks out saying he believes that his family may have been stalked and someone was watching them in the days before the disappearance. And we'll talk more about that later because it seems like he may have been right. In the meantime, there's a ton of press and speculation and false leads. And by the end of July 2008, a year after Madeline went missing, the Portuguese police have hit a wall and they remove the Arguido status on both Robert Marat and on the McCanns. And they stop actively investigating Madeline's disappearance. In May 2011, on what would have been Madeline's eighth birthday, Kate publishes a book. I haven't actually read any of the books around this case, have you? I read Vanished, but that must have been like 10 years ago, so a lot has happened in the meantime. Was it good? Uh, Honestly, I don't remember it neither negatively nor positively. It must have been all right, I guess. Sure. But as I said, it's such a a long long time time, that has passed. Yeah, I've watched more news pieces and documentaries, the Netflix series, of mm. course. Yeah, I tried to watch Amaral's uh, documentary, The Truth of a Lie. I just found it to be in really poor taste. I couldn't really get into it. And then there's a really good 60 Minutes Australia piece update. We'll link to that as well. It's really well done. And they actually bring up the story of Ben Needham. Uh, yeah, we covered his disappearance as a toddler in Greece in, I think it was episode 21, mm-hmm. The International Tales, and Ben's mother Carrie is in regular contact with Kate McCann. One can think of Kate McCann however they want, but I have to say one thing though. The McCanns were never stopping to keep this case in the headlines. They kept things going for as much as they could, in my opinion, and that reminds me a lot of Johnny Gosh's mother, uh, Noreen. Yeah, I agree. I absolutely agree. And I think it angered a lot of people at the time. This case, I think there was a lot of outrage and some of it righteous, some of it not so much towards the McCanns. I think the tabloids Mm. hit this case so hard that many people, myself included, really thought they might have been involved you know? And then once that seed is sort of planted, it's very easy then to see their desperate search for their missing daughter as maybe it's attention seeking in a Mm. less desirable and understandable way, you know? But I agree. And I think most of us would do the same. Yeah. Especially driven not just by the love you have for your child, but very specifically in this case, probably the incredible amount of guilt you must feel for their part and whatever has happened to her. Because even if you take the kindest, most understanding, most empathetic view of what happened that night, her parents are partly responsible for whatever happened in a way that Johnny Gosh or Aisha Degree or Ben Needham's family are not, right? There there was a level of neglect there. And I mean, even families that are not responsible at all, that did nothing wrong, Uh, feel extremely guilty. Of course. Like there always comes, what if, and I should have done this or should I have done that. Oh, yeah. So how must you feel if there is, as you say, some level of guilt? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it seems that the release of the book uh, of Kate McKeon gets the attention Kate was likely hoping for in writing it because a new investigation is launched to review Maddie's case. And this was something that then Home Secretary Theresa May and Prime Minister David Cameron were both in support of. And about a year later, they release an age progression of what Madeline may look like at age nine. And they encourage the Portuguese police to reopen the investigation, but they don't think there's any new evidence substantial enough to warrant reopening the case. 
And two years later, so 4th of July 2013, Scotland Yard confirmed it launched its own investigation called Operation Grange into Madeline's disappearance. They believe they have dozens of new leads and almost 40 new persons of interest. That October, Portuguese police also reopened the case to pursue new lines of questioning. And over the coming years, there would be more leads followed, sniffer dogs again search an area of land nearby where police and locals had already scoured in the earliest days of her disappearance. And there was a lot of drama around this case. The McCann's sued their local police to try and get them to release information. The McCann's hired private investigators with the Medi Fund, which was breaking the law in Portugal. And the sense is that rather than working together to a common goal, there was so much mistrust and poor communication from the beginning by everyone involved that everyone had some negative feelings. Yeah, they did. And I think some bad feelings were warranted and others were just very high emotion handled badly. Yeah, oh, definitely. Yeah. Uh, the Tapas Nine and Robert Murat and some of his friends, pretty much everyone won money in libel lawsuits against tabloids and papers. The Tapas Seven donated the 375 million pounds they were awarded back into the Medi Fund. Which is good. I mean. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think the Netflix documentary, if you haven't watched it, please do. Watching the Netflix documentary is when initially we started to think about doing this case. And at mm. the time when the Netflix documentary came out, we watched it, we wrote all of our notes. And then in the end, it was like, oh, man. There's nothing to talk about except really grim, sad, horrific speculation. It's like, let's just put this on a back burner. And now we finally yeah. have some more information. So it makes more sense to discuss it. But the thing the Netflix documentary does do such a good job of highlighting for me anyhow is what an incredible circus this whole thing was. Just, it was completely out of control. It really was. The private investigators that were hired, it's some really disturbing stuff. And and there's a ton of information that we aren't even touching on. And I know there are a lot of like diehard um, fans would be the wrong term, but I'm sure we've got listeners who are deeply devoted to this case and to her cause who are saying, wait, you're not talking about, mm. you know, all of this. And that said, you know, one of the PI groups that was, was hired, as bad as so many of them were, one of them did end up uncovering a child sex ring in Spain. Uh, so it didn't find Madeline, but it did help others in a bad situation. Okay. So the police now have a few more leads. They've got more sketches that are made. And a few even have facial features. Interestingly, <laughs> the Jane Tanner sketch, she works with an artist to create a sketch of the man that she saw carrying a child. And she said he was walking in a very purposeful way. And so while both sketches have absolutely no facial features, hers is sort of useful, Right? Because one man did come forward and said that he was probably the man she saw that night carrying his sleeping daughter back to their apartment. And then there were just a lot of alleged sightings of Maddie over the years. Yeah, people thought they saw her in Portugal, of course, Spain, Morocco, Malta, New Zealand, and even in India. But yeah, nothing ever came of it. In September of 2015, the UK government says it has spent over 10 million pounds on the case. A month later, Scotland Yard cuts the number of staff working on Operation Grange from 28 to 10. In 2017, on the 10th anniversary of Madeline's disappearance, the McCanns give an interview with the BBC, and they say that they will never give up hope that they'll find their daughter. And it now seems like we may finally have some answers. But first, we need to take a quick break for an ad for today's sponsor, Lulu Bug Jewelry. And we were really excited to be doing this ad because we already really genuinely love this shop. And we've both mentioned how much we love Sue's work in the past. Yes, I love her designs. And I got really, really excited when she wanted to sponsor one of our episodes. I have two of her sterling necklaces. One is from her tiny necklace collection and it has a tiny bear on it because I call my husband Herr Bear. <laughs> <laughs> and the second one is a freshwater pearl pendant that is carved into a skull. And I just, I love her designs. And man, if I could, I would have tried to snag one of the owl necklaces that she had just released. Did you see them? Yes, I I mean, need to go back and take another look at those. She also made an incredible Fordite and sterling silver card weight for me for an anniversary present for Paul. You can find her store at lulubugjewelry.net and she really does have just 
a wonderful collection of gift ideas for really every budget. And if you maybe want to treat yourself with a little something. Exactly. I just bought the two necklaces as a treat for myself. And we've got a promo code for you. Our listeners will get 10% off their order with the promo code Keep Going that you can use on her web store. That's keep going, all one word, all capital letters, and that's 10% off. And did I mention how nicely wrapped her pieces arrive? I think I may have, but they're beautifully wrapped. And it's so tempting to open the box and peek, but I don't tie bows as well as she does. And it's one less thing you'll have to wrap this year. And of course, we'll link to Lulubug Jewelry's wonderful web store in our show notes. And don't forget promo code keep going for 10% off. Okay, so two years later, in May 2019, local Portuguese police say they are seriously looking at a foreign pedophile as a suspect in the case, and a year later, this past spring, police announced there is a suspect in prison who they believe is likely the person who abducted Madeline. He's called Christian B. in his native Germany due to their privacy laws, but the U.S. and the U.K. have named him. So let's discuss Christian Bruckner and... Warning, this is where things are going to get, um, it's just bad. It's sick and infuriating, and, um, you've been warned. So, a lot of this information is from that 60 Minutes Australia piece we mentioned earlier. We'll include that link, and, of course couple of dozen uh, news articles. It's also interesting to say that in German-speaking media, there is almost no information on the whole thing yet. As Annie said, what we know so far is mostly from Australia and the UK. It's so fascinating to me. Mm. Yeah. I think they just want to have really, you know, an airtight case in Germany. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's 1992 in Würzburg, Bavaria, 15-year-old Christian gets his first police record robbing a house. In 1994, at the age of 17, he was convicted of sexual abuse of a child, attempted sexual abuse of a child, and carrying out sexual acts in front of a child, and he's sentenced to two years in a youth facility. It's so shocking to me that his sentence was so light. I know he was still considered a youth at 17, but I believe he'd be tried as an adult here. And this was, I I believe, this was a group of children that he had under his control, and he raped a child. I mean, how? Two years? It's That's just so shocking Mm. to me. The sad thing is, it's definitely not the worst sentencing I've seen in cases like this over here. (sighs) But yeah, hang on, everybody, it gets so much worse. Yeah. So he flees Germany for Portugal in 1995 to avoid having to go to a youth detention center for these crimes. He's 18 and living in a house less than two kilometers from Ocean Club Resort. Looks like he's tracked down and ends up going back to Germany in 1999 to serve the two-year youth sentence, but he gets out and goes back to Portugal, more specifically back to Praia da Luz, He's an unsurprisingly shitty boyfriend, abusive and cruel. He makes a living stealing, breaking into mostly ground floor apartments and robbing tourists and small time drug dealing. He's living about a kilometer from the apartment Madeline went missing from. But it seems he lived out of a camper when in Portugal and then had a huge American style RV. So he had no fixed address in Portugal and he clearly moves from Portugal to Germany easily. In 2005, he breaks into the home of a 70-year-old American widow living in Praia da Luz. He ties her up and tortures and rapes her over an extended period of time. She's badly beaten with a metal rod that uh, they believe he brought with him, but fortunately she survives the attack. In 2006, the case is dropped due to lack of evidence and the victim never speaks of it to anyone, too ashamed to tell her friends. He filmed the entire attack and left DNA behind. He was busy that year and was also convicted for stealing diesel fuel in Portugal, and when asked in court about a previous record, he apparently admits to the judge he has a history of felony sex abuse crime, but he says he has no residence in Portugal, although he had been there for about 10 years more or less, but as he wasn't a resident, the crimes against children he committed in Germany were not on his local record. He wouldn't give an address and it's believed he contacted someone and had them remove all of the computers and drives from his house while he was in prison for eight months. He was released in December 2006 and was in Praia da Luz when Madeline went missing. 
In May 2007, Madeleine McCann disappears from Praia da Luz. Authorities can now confirm that his cell phone records put Christian in the area without an hour of her disappearance, as he was on a long call nearby. Many people have speculated that whoever took Madeleine, it was likely to be two people. You'd need a lookout, right? Was it someone working in the restaurant who had seen the note saying that the Tapas 9 wanted that same table every night so they could see the building their kids were alone in? The day after Madeline goes missing, Christian transfers the registration of a Jaguar car he owns to someone else and leaves the area, heading back to Germany. Also in 2007 are more drug charges. In 2011, he serves time for smuggling cannabis in Germany. In 2012, he opens a kiosk in Braunschweig in northwest Germany. Quick uh, explanation, a kiosk in Germany, or it's called a Trafik in Austria, is a little shop where you buy cigarettes, newspapers and magazines. You can play the lottery and sometimes they also offer a small variety of chips, snacks and drinks. More importantly, this kiosk is right next to a kindergarten and a few other schools with primary school age kids. And he's known to giving little kids free lollipops. It's so cliche. Yeah, it's awful. He also has much younger girlfriends that he is physically abusive to. One reported he strangled her once when he was angry. And it's around this time that he allegedly tells a friend that he would really like a secret dungeon set up at his rented cottage, like Josef Fritzl or Wolfgang Priklopil had done. I will... Definitely never cover the Fritzl case because the victims never spoke about it and they never appeared in any media and they really just want to have a life for themselves now. Yeah, no, we we would never want to do a case like that when the people that are most effective do not want more information out there. You know, we try very hard to respect that. But I really would like to do an episode about Natasha Kampusch one day. Uh, She is the complete opposite. She did talk publicly about what had happened to her. And what I hated most about the Kampusch case is that she was treated very unfairly by the Austrian public for it. I have mentioned it Mm. several times already. Yeah. Yeah, you need to cover that one. But back to Madeline, in 2013, the McCanns are again doing more press and they're in Germany on TV showing two drawings done by a sketch artist. And this pays off because it leads to a few people calling police to say it looks like this man they know called Christian. And they give the police all the info they need to find Christian B. Unfortunately, when this happens, the local police decide the way to approach this is to send him a letter requesting him to come to the police station to answer questions as a witness in Madeline's case. (sighs) Uh, Shockingly, he does not show for the questioning and now he knows they suspect him. Also in 2013, it's believed that he was regularly posting in a chat room for pedophiles and we're not going to get into what he said. Uh, his presence there is enough, we think. Yeah, he was he was active in that group. He wasn't just a lurker. Yeah. And I think that's all you need to know. We don't, you don't need to know anything other than that. See, I will warn you though, if you do watch that 60 Minutes Australia article that we'll link to, they do get more into that and they have information of things that he actually posted and things that he wanted to do to children. So it's just yeah. be warned. Yeah, we're not going to get into that. So it's May 2nd, 2015, so almost eight years to the day since Madeline vanished and another little girl, Inka Gericke, vanished. She was five years old, a charming, joyous child, and she was visiting the Wilhelmshof district of Stendal. Her parents uh, and siblings were visiting parents, friends and their kids and the two families were close and did this very often. The kids went into the woods to get sticks for a fire and when they came back, they came back without Inga. This happened within two hours of where Christian was living at the time and he also owns a van that matches the description of one scene leaving the area Inga was abducted from. This case is now being more closely examined as authorities believe she may be another possible victim of Christian B. Yeah, unfortunately, there are quite a few of them out there. Also, in 2015, they search a remote property that belongs to Christian, and they find a lot. Investigators discover computer hard drives, photos, and other evidence, and just tons of it. Over 8,000 pieces of evidence. Also on the property is what you hear referred to as an American camper van. So... There are two camper vans that come up in this case. One is like a small VW 
like a Scooby-Doo or a, you know, like a little camper van that you see more commonly in, you see them here sometimes. My dad had one, but like. I love them. They're bullies. Yeah. yeah. Just. Or the older, older generation bullies. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The little, the little VW camper buses. Right. And so sometimes he would live in that when he was in Portugal. But then at this property in Germany, there's a much bigger, what I would call an American style RV. Right. So for people mm-hmm. in the EU, the UK, more like the size of a coach bus that you'd take several hours journey on, right? It's like 10 meter long. I wouldn't drive it. Paul could drive it. I wouldn't attempt it, right? So big. It's it's people live in these things. But in this camper, they also found a lot of really disturbing evidence. And the only thing that they mention to the public is that they find a number of little girls bathing suits. So that's fucking horrific. <sighs> In 2016, he's charged with sexual abuse of a child, quote, in the act of creating and possessing, end quote, abuse images. He gets 15 months. In 2017, he's convicted in another sex abuse crime against a child and sentenced to another 15 months. Meanwhile, in 2017, the interview that Kate and Jerry had done was replayed in Germany because it was the 10th anniversary of Madeline's disappearance. And when they did, when it was shown, they really did get a lot of new tips and information. And people were reporting to the authorities that they had heard Christian confess that he was the one responsible for Madeline, even though it might have been at a bar. But even more damning from an evidentiary perspective is that some of these people were saying that they had seen the video of Christian raping and torturing that uh, 72-year-old woman in Portugal back in 2005. And so the police found that and also footage of another rape as well, a year earlier. That victim was a young Irish woman named Hazel, and she had been similarly assaulted by a man who broke into the ground floor apartment that she was staying in not far from Praia de Luz. And at the time, she reported to the authorities in Portugal that her attacker had been young, blonde, and had a German or Dutch accent, and that he had filmed the attack. In 2018, Christian is arrested in Milan on drug charges, and he is returned to Germany and jailed. So now, in it's then it's 2019, and he's still in prison on those drug charges, and he's arrested for the rape of the um, American woman in 2005. And they have the video he made. They have the DNA evidence to convict him. He still insists he's innocent. And he gets seven years in prison for this attack. Even after all the other... Yeah, seven years. And he tried very hard to appeal, actually. He was... I think that he was complaining that literally, I think he was saying, I agreed to come back and go to prison on these drug charges, but you didn't mention the rape seems to be his defense, more or less. It's just, yeah. But I think the police involved are all really glad that his bid failed because he's still behind bars and they're running out of time to build a rock-solid case against him in the case of Madeleine McCann, as well as several others. It seems, unlike in the United States, where there is no statute of limitations on murder, it looks like in Portugal... It looked like it's only 15 years. And am I right? In Germany, it was also like 15 years, but then they got rid of a statute of limitations after the Second World War, right? To prevent the Nazis from, you know, war criminals, basically, to stop protecting them. Uh, yeah, you, you're absolutely correct. Before that, it was 20 years, as far as I know, yeah. and they got rid of it because they were scared that, um, yeah, that they couldn't convict uh, any Nazi crimi- war criminals after... 20 years had passed, you know. Like if you just spent 20 years in Argentina, then go home. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) In Portugal, I really think it's 15 years, which is absolutely horrifying. I mean, as you said, just stay ahead of the authorities for 15 years and then you're in the clear for murder. Yeah. 
This past June, they also dug up an allotment in Hanover where he used to spend time when uh, he owned the kiosk. And there they uncovered a basement that he had dug beneath his shed. Likely he didn't make his dream of having his own dungeon come true. And the new owners of the space and his old neighborhood, they gave permission for police to search away. Yeah, the people are so helpful. I think the one woman who owns the allotment now, it looks like they can have little sheds or little tiny houses not to live in, but you could spend a night maybe now and then is it is it is that common in german i see, i realize i also ask you questions about germany all the time like you should know everything <laughs> when you're in a completely different country but i think in my subconscious i imagine austria and germany are like massachusetts and new hampshire and I, it, it's not it's, yeah. it is but it's not yeah. no it's it's pretty similar laws in in germany and austria are pretty yeah. similar i even talked about the allotment gardens in the mathematic episode yeah. You can't live there all year round, here in Austria at least. I really don't know how it is in Germany. I, I would assume it's very, very similar. You can't live here there all year round, but usually you can, you can live there during summer months, for example. I think there are some loopholes. I even know of cases where people did build a real tiny home on the property, which I personally think it's super weird because you just rent that allotment yearly. Mm. Like, I just had to pay the rent for my dad's allotment. Uh, it was 57 euros for the whole year. It's a small garden and it just has a garden hut on it. So, oh, yeah. No, I think that's nice. You do get allotments here, but I don't think you'd have any sort of a structure. Listen, I, I know nothing about allotment gardens. Don't listen to me on anything. Anyhow, the woman who now owns the allotment that Christian had previously owned, she was basically saying that she just can't bear the idea that, you know, he might have buried people beneath where she sleeps at night. So all of the neighbors must have just fucking hated this guy because they're like, search my place. You want to dig all my shit up? Go for it. Like, get in there. Yeah, you just you just get the sense that they don't they didn't like him. And they also tell the police that they saw him excavating a basement. So I think that led to quite a lot of the evidence that they found. Which is also definitely forbidden in an allotment garden. And if German people are similar to Austrian people, which they are, you also have this kind of, you know, somebody does something that's forbidden in something like an allotment garden. Everybody knows. Yeah. Everybody knows. And people start talking. And yeah, I think that's how they found quite a lot, actually. Yeah. Yeah. So Hans Christian Walter, he is the prosecutor that is leading the investigation into Christian Bruckner. And here is a little bit from his press conference. It's in German. <laughs> Im Zusammenhang mit dem Verschwinden des dreijährigen britischen Mädchens Madeleine Beth McKenn am 3. Mai 2007 aus einer Apartmentanlage in Praia da Luz in Portugal ermittelt die Staatsanwaltschaft Braunschweig gegen einen 43-jährigen deutschen Staatsangehörigen wegen des Verdachts des Mordes. Daraus können Sie entnehmen, dass wir davon ausgehen, dass das Mädchen tot ist. Bei den Beschuldigten handelt es sich um einen mehrfach vorbestraften Sexualstraftäter, der unter anderem auch wegen sexuellen Missbrauchs von Kindern bereits verurteilt wurde. Derzeit verbüßt er in anderer Sache eine längere Haftstrafe. So the German police are saying here that they have evidence that their suspect Christian B was responsible for Madeline's disappearance and that they have evidence that she's actually dead. Yeah. And they haven't said really much more than that at all. Probably, as you said earlier, Johanna, because they're trying to build a case. But mm. based on what we know as a fact based on the videos that people who knew Christian were shown and led to other convictions, I'm guessing that they found a videotape, which yep. is awful. It's awful. But we know they're saying that they are sure she's dead, and they know how she died, and they know who killed her. And they're also saying that they have no body and no body parts. So, what else could it be, right? Mm. And Christian's attorney is... All right, so listen, no disrespect at all to public defenders because absolutely everyone deserves to have a fair trial. But he's in the 60 Minutes Australia interview and he sounds like a cliche villain. 
honestly. He's like, <laughs> he's like, what, watch me do a terrible accent. He's like, my client will cooperate with the German authorities when you can order a tall glass of holy water in hell. <laughs> like, <laughs> such a fucking ass. He really, it's like, is this... Are you serious? Is this this is the this is the response you're giving when your when your client is accused of these incredibly horrific crimes? He's such a fucking asshole. It's like you're talking about the rape and murder of more than one child. Don't be such a smug son of a bitch. It's it's just gross. It's gross. Yeah. Yeah, I watched an interview on German TV. He seems to like colorful socks, which is surprising. And he thinks that Christian B is innocent. And in the lawyer's opinion, the, you know, the Kate and Jeremy can covered up an accident theory is actually what had happened to Madeline. That's what he thinks. Well, he's lazy because he's just trying to ride the coattails of the tabloid press. And he doesn't deserve colorful socks. <laughs> They were pretty pink socks. I mm. like them. He doesn't deserve them. He should only have white socks that were accidentally washed with other things. So no, they're no longer <laughs> white, but they're also not any specific sort of color you can name. They're sort of <laughs> grige. That's all he deserves. All right. <laughs> It's so it's it's horrible. It's Don't awful. you think it's horrible it's, if you think about the yeah. fact that I mean I'd say Madeline McCann is one of the most infamous missing child in the last 10 years right for sure and to think they found a video in the last 20 years probably sorry yeah because it's been more than 10 years since she went missing yeah, yeah true yeah in the last 20 years sorry yeah it's unbelievable yeah all right so i'd say let's look back at the three possibilities of what happened to madeline so the three options were number one her parents were involved somehow Two, she wandered off on her own and met with foul play or an accident. Three, stranger abduction. I think we both agree that two is right out. We talked about it briefly in last week's episode. We don't think she could get the sliding door open or, you know, that she would remember to close the sliding door after, you know, leaving the room. Yeah. So we don't think that this was an Asher degree situation. No, I agree. I think we both thought it was possible that the McCanns maybe did have something to do with it. Mm. So the Portuguese journalist, there's a local Portuguese journalist, and you see her in everything. She's great. She's very well spoken. She's been on it since the beginning. And her name is, I'm going to pronounce it wrong, Sandra um, Felgueras, I think. And she's, she's just great. You'll see her in almost all the documentaries on this case. She says she went to the restaurant and sat at the table that the McCanns were seated at every night and that you cannot see the apartment from the restaurant. And so why would you lie about such a very small, simple, easily verifiable thing? And then I think that's what started the suspicion on the parents was with that, right? Yeah. And the view that they did have, sorry, but what's the red flag? So you can sort of look across a pool and a wall and some shrubbery and hedges and things. You don't have eyes on most of the windows and doors. You don't have eyes on the window of your child's room. And so what are you keeping an eye out for? Fucking billowing smoke from that general direction? I mean, I just... Yeah, plus as the entrance, you know, the back entrance to the apartment was around the corner, they didn't, they couldn't even see if somebody would walk in there. If, no. if you had a view on that back entrance and you could keep an eye on nobody walking there getting into the apartment okay but there there was just no way they could see that right no no i don't think there was and i always thought that they did give their kids something to make sure they would sleep maybe that was the reason that kate said they took her instead of she's gone because she knew that there was no way that maddie would have been able to wake up at that time maybe oh Oh, see, that's interesting. I never thought of the they've taken her as meaning she knew there was no way she'd have gotten up on account of the quieting drugs. Yeah. I thought it was to like immediate red herring. You know, that's what it always seemed to me. Yeah. Yeah, to me too. Yeah. Yeah. But that's a really good point. And for a long time, I really did think that there had been some sort of accident or accidental overdose, just yeah. something that happened, and then they just covered it up in fear, right? Like, I thought maybe all of them had drugged their kids to keep them safely asleep, and like in a way, I get it. Like, 
I don't know. I think when it comes to getting judgy with people, I try to ask myself, were they doing the best they could under the circumstances? And the answer to that in this case is absolutely fucking not. No, they weren't. They were lazy and they were selfish and they were lax with their children's safety. And I really do think if they weren't wealthy and white, they would have been arrested and that they should have been arrested. But we talked about the timeline and there's no way. I cannot work out how or when they would have moved Madeline if she had accidentally died. It's just too hard. It doesn't fit, you know? And I think a lot of people thought that them wanting to reach out to their priest immediately was suspicious, thinking that they wanted to confess the accidental death and cover-up of said accidental death. But now I think they may have just called to ask for forgiveness because they were responsible for her fate. I think they knew that they were the ones who were ultimately responsible for whatever Madeline went through. It was their fault, at least partly. And they did need to ask forgiveness from their priest for that. I think that might be why there was some iffiness about the whole Tapas Nine as well. I mean, I think a lot of people took some of their behavior to mean that they knew Madeline had died and that they were helping the McCanns cover it up. But I think it was more likely that they knew they could all be arrested on child endangerment or abandonment mm. and neglect. And I think that's what they were afraid afraid of, legitimately af- and should have been afraid of. And that's what made them seem suspicious. About the McCann's uh, reaching out to their priests, they are devout Catholics. And if they have a real close relationship to the priest, which I assume they, they do... It actually does make a lot of sense to me that they would contact the priest in good parishes. The priest is actually there to support the church members in all trying life situations. So for me personally, that never, you know, not for one second did that make me raise an eyebrow, to be honest. That's another good reason, very good reason not to find it suspicious. Yeah. So the other thing is, you know, set reservations and timing plans. They're great for wanting to keep kids on a schedule. But they're also great for people with bad intentions who can figure out pretty fucking quickly that you've got a routine when you're home, when your place is empty, and worst of all, when your children are home alone. That is just, yeah. it's awful. I do think that Christian probably saw that family or maybe someone at the Ocean Club who was aware of the standing reservation. They might not have even known that the kids were home alone. Remember, Christian made a living robbing apartments. And it's very True. possible that he just knew someone who was helping him uh, with robberies. And then he found Madeline. And he was definitely the sort of person who would go in intending to just rob a place, see a child that age, and absolutely, yeah. that would be a temptation. Yeah. I think both things are absolutely possible, but I don't think he would necessarily need a second person because uh, it would have been so easy to know the group's evening schedule after just a couple of days, you know, even if he had no inside tipster. You That's just have true. to be on the main road and watch, right? Yeah. Do you think the person... Who took her, do you think, well, I, mis I really do think probably it is Christian, but do you think whoever took her, do you think they opened the window as a decoy or to hand her off to somebody? That's the thing I was wondering. If the window and the shutter were open, was it two people where he handed her off through the window so that she was already out of view from, mm. you know what I mean? Oh, it's possible, yeah. Yeah. You almost feel like you'd want a lookout because while they were doing pretty regular checks, I don't think they were probably, I don't think, well, I know that a lot of them weren't wearing watches, which caused a problem with some of the timeline. But also, I doubt very much that they had, you know, like the timer on their phone going off every 15 minutes for a check. I'm sure it yeah. was a, oop, better get out, you Definitely. know. So I think maybe having a comp, but you never know. You never know. I think the two-person theory is partly also because there was that call that came to Christian's phone, which is how yeah. they placed him in the area, right? And they, they said That's true, yeah. both of those phone numbers are available. You can look at them to see if you recognize them because they're trying to figure out who placed the call. But it was from somewhere within the Ocean Club, but they still don't know who who did it. But it was a long phone call. I think they were on the phone for like over a half hour. And a lot of people said they believed that Madeline was taken and sold to a nice couple and raised as their own. And I mean, that's, it's possible. It's definitely possible. But if that were the case, I would think one of the younger children or both of the younger children, if you had someone helping you, would have been worth more in an illegal 
I'm doing air quotes adoption. Whereas predators know that babies are a lot harder to care for than a, you know, just past toddler age child. This whole, this whole case, you just need a shower. It's just awful. I think that was just wishful thinking. I think we hear that in almost all missing children cases, you know, they hope a nice couple just wanted to have a child and uh, he's doing fine or she's doing fine. I could be completely wrong, but I do think chances for that are almost non-existent. And even if there are those cases, wouldn't a criminal rather target a kid from an underprivileged family, you know, a family that might not have the means and support to raise absolute hell through media? Yeah. Also, you might not want to kidnap a child with such obvious facial features like Maddie's eye, for example. But then, okay, she maybe she was still sleeping, she was drugged, she didn't open her eyes, and he didn't know that. And if he'd been watching her from a distance all week, he wouldn't have noticed it. No, it's, I think you have to be closer to them, right? I agree, yeah. And do you think that they... So do we, but we agree that they may have drugged the kids a little? Or... I still think that's highly likely. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because there's that thing where it's like during the time when everybody was searching the apartment, the twins never woke up and Kate reportedly never stopped checking their breathing, Mm. which I think if you're, I don't know, I just feel like if you, if you think your child's been taken, I understand keeping an eye on them, but checking that they're breathing seems very specific, right? Yeah. And She said that she thought later on, she said that she thought a stranger had drugged them. Yeah, but then also she's a doctor. And if she thinks somebody drugged her kids, wouldn't you try anything to wake them up? And I don't think she did that. She just checked their breathing, right? Yep. Yep. It's just off, I think. And I think if they had been even lightly sedated, like this happens all the time if we're at my little summer cottage, long day in the sun swimming, and then a Benadryl at bedtime because it's allergy season, and good night, you know, I'll sleep through a thunderstorm, sleep through anything. And he could have walked right in, scooped her up, and she just thought it was mom or dad picking her up, right? Because I remember, I actually have memories of being carried from the car as a kid, right? And oh God, isn't that the best feeling when you'd, you'd pull into the driveway and you were sort of awake, but not really with it. It still happens all the time. And then your parent would open the door and rather than be like, come on, get out. (laughs) They just pick you up and carry you into bed. And it was just like, oh, it's the safest, snuggliest, cared for sort of innocent. Every kid should have that. But if it happened enough that I have the occasional memory of it, it's very possible that was the case here, right? Just walk in, quietly pick her up, walk right out again. And you're almost out of Spain before she even woke up and realized that she wasn't with daddy. I mean, it's awful, but yeah, yeah, it's possible. I absolutely agree. And you know what? He might have already tried the night before when Maddie woke up crying. And maybe the next night-night dose that evening was slightly higher just to make sure this time that the kids would sleep through the night without waking up again. Yeah. No, that's a really good point. And Kate's background in anesthesiology, Mm. it just makes me wonder, you know. But either way, I think it's Very safe to say that Christian is the first really good suspect we've had in in this case. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Police are still searching in both Portugal and Germany and near different places where Christian was known to have been. Because remember, he had places that he stayed in Portugal, but then he'd be in a van. It was the same in Germany. And there's always it's like weird properties or like a van in the woods. None of it's good. And there are a lot of missing children out there with families who are desperate for answers. And he might be the answer to a lot of them, which is awful. It must be so horrible, the not having closure and not having answers part. I guess by now most of you know that uh, missing person cases are my absolute rabbit hole cases. And that's That's the part that always gets to me, those poor people who are left without any answers. Yeah. You know, losing a loved one is always horrible. It's so hard. But to not know what happened, that must be absolutely unbearable. I can't. Yeah, I can't even imagine. And I know I've said it before, but I'm going to say it again. I am so fucking frustrated at the way sex offenders are treated so lightly in seemingly every country. Mm. There are nonviolent people in prison who got caught with a joint, literally doing more time than a man who sexually assaulted a child are. That's insane, 
Rape laws in most countries are nowhere near what they should be. Especially repeat offenders. How does this guy who is repeatedly over and over and over and over again being convicted on child sex abuse and child rape? 15 months? Are you fucking kidding me? And, you know, people like us, and by that I mean people who are into true crime, people who work in law enforcement, we see over and over and over again this pattern of rape and sexual assault before it escalates to murder. And so... How do we keep letting them out of prison? This is very topical right now because there's a man here in Massachusetts named Wayne Chapman, and he admitted to sexually assaulting over a 100 boys. He's been in prison, and he was just deemed too old to be a risk to anyone and was released to a a local nursing home to protect him from COVID. And I'm so fucking angry. It fills me with so much rage because he should die alone in prison. Before his transfer, like when they were getting ready to have him transferred, he was exposing himself to prison staff. Yeah, right. So you don't have to be strong enough to physically overpower someone and physically rape them to still hurt people, right? He is taking up space. Just think of the Golden State Killer. He kept calling his victims when he was just, he was already an old fart by then. exactly. And he still hurt people. Yes. Mm. And this fucking guy is now taking up space. Taxpayers are paying for him to be in a nursing home that some very honest, hardworking family cannot afford for their beautiful, lovely, law-abiding loved one. And this guy's Mm. got a spot there. And I really hope he's not allowed any interaction with anyone. I just have to mention it because he's local and we, universally, we just hate him. And I just really wish that universally, we took a much harder look at violent sexual assault crime. It's just ignored in a way that is just rage, rage, rage. So, all right. That's where we are. That is, as far as we know at the moment, what's going on with Madeline McCann. And obviously, there's, what, two years, so a little over a year left to see if they're going to end up charging him in her, well, murder. And so we will keep you posted if developments keep coming up. Yeah. All right. Definitely. Let's, uh, I need a Silkwood shower, but let's talk about something good. Want me to go first? Yes, please. My something good this week is the countryside. Uh, You know that we moved from Vienna to the countryside. We are building a house here. And honestly, I loved Vienna. I always used to love cities and I still like to go visit cities. But it was uh, not good for my mental health in the end Mm -hmm. to be always surrounded by noise and people. and, And, you know, even though Vienna is a beautiful city, it's just, it got too much. I was born in the countryside. I used to live in the countryside until I was like 20. And I'm so glad to be out of the city again because now I take walks with the dogs. I don't see anybody, just <laughs> rabbits and, and, uh, yeah, the like, bumbies. <laughs> That's good. And now that it's dark so early, we take the walks in the evening and I see stars. And I haven't seen stars in ages when I was living in the city. I think all of you people living in cities know what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Even here. And it has been so good for my mental health. I'm less nervous. The dogs are less nervous. It's just good all around. That's awesome. So that's my something good. <laughs> that's awesome. I'm so happy to hear that. Oh, we don't, we have the same issue here. I'm not even in downtown Boston. I'm um, like 10 miles outside and, and we can't really, we don't see stars the way we do on the Cape, you know. Yeah, like uh, nobody talks about it. It's barely talked about uh, light pollution and noise pollution, but it's, I don't think it's healthy for, for humans to be always surrounded by light and noise, right? No, there's a movement here now where people are trying to get more of the uh, light pollution out. And there's like when you buy exterior lamps and things, it'll tell you how it's rated for light pollution. When we built the Garage Mahal, we have a little cupola on top. And most of the time, that's just what we leave lit. And I love it because we have a like a motion. There's a plane landing soon at Logan, if you can hear that. But there's a um, motion sensor light 
And when it turns on, our bat, our resident bat, who I love beyond words, um, flies around the light and eats the mosquitoes and things that moths, mm-hmm. whatever's attracted to the light. And now the last few days, we've seen him, I'll actually have to post a video because Paul sent it to me, of him just doing big loops around between the cupola and the light on the house. So I think he's just flying around having a little bat buffet every night and I would die <laughs> for that bat. I love him so much. My something good is that the one takeaway I had from watching all of these documentaries is that I really want to visit Portugal. Hi, Ania and Olga. We miss you. And we're coming to visit you when we can travel again. I know this case was a really difficult one for the people of Praia de Luz and Portugal in general, especially because it's a place that relies so heavily on tourism right, for the economy. Mm -hmm. And so cases like this are always difficult. But no matter where you are in the world, there's going to be a potential for crime everywhere. So maybe just lock your doors all the time. And lastly, this week is Thanksgiving. Um, Tomorrow is American Thanksgiving. And so I just wanted to say how thankful I am for you, for everything you do for our podcast. And thank you to all the friends we've made since we started this. It's really been a remarkable journey. God, that sounds... You always make me blush when you say that. <laughs> No, it's true, though. Ah, thank you, Annie. We just, we, we have the nicest... That's true. We have the best listeners. People, don't mm. we? We really yeah. have the best listeners. I'm just so grateful. I just can't tell you. If you also want to get to know the other listeners, come join our Facebook group. It's lovely there. It's oh, yeah. nice. It's safe. It is. Uh, it's a lot of memes, a lot of houses. Yeah, a lot of houses. We do talk about murder, yeah. but also just we talk about everything. It's just Facebook without politics. Yes, yeah, that's true. Please, if uh, we would be very thankful if you would leave us a review. How was that? Was that good? Was that like suave? <laughs> On this, our week of Thanksgiving, please leave us a review. Freshhellpodcast.com is our website where you can find links to our merch, our... Oh, speaking of merch, we have a discount for Black Friday, right? Starting today when this episode drops, and it's going to be until Sunday. What did we decide on the promo yes, code? Yes, it's going to be 10% off if you use the... Is Opus now okay? Yeah, yeah. I wanted the promo code to be everything is fucked for me today, <laughs> but it's too long. So it's just Opus. Yeah, use the, use the promo code <laughs> Opus and you get 10% off until Sunday. Yeah. Uh, also, yeah. if you want to join our Patreon, uh, you can find the link to it on our webpage or you go to Patreon directly and search for Fresh Hell Podcast. We will pop up. We'll do at least two episodes per month. We're trying our best. It's not going to be crime related or episodes that are like our usual podcast episodes. It's more, you know, suave us chit chatting about, suave. about, it's, it's <laughs> actually very pretty suave. awkward. <laughs> we're still very, very awkward. We're finding our way, but it's, it's fun. Yeah. So far, we talked it's about good. dogs. We talked about time machines and the next. We're working on villains. Yeah, the next episode is going to be about fictional villains, which is going to be fun because any, any <laughs> is, uh, so knowledgeable <laughs> about movies. <laughs> it's going to be great. <laughs> <laughs> I think Johanna, we've made, we're making our own list and I have a feeling Johanna's list of like her favorite villains <laughs> is going to be all of these like classic, right? You're going to have like, um, Jack Nicholson and The Shining. I mean, and my <laughs> list is like that one gremlin with the mohawk. <laughs> <laughs> I stand by my list. It's going to be great. So. This is the kind of great stuff we discussed on Patreon. (laughs) So come join us at Patreon. We love you. Happy Thanksgiving if you're in America, and we're thankful for you no matter where you are. Please, please, please tell your dogs we say hi. Not only your dogs, your cats, your guinea pigs, your llamas, I don't know what else you have out there with you. Your chickens. Flying squirrels. (laughs) Bats. Uh, Yeah. We love Anybody them. Have it, Say yeah. hi to the spiders. We don't love them, but we don't want them to feel excluded. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> As always, if you are going through hell, keep going. Tschüss. That's my, that's my turkey. You did that last year already. Did I really? I forgot. Damn it. <laughs> I have such a shitty memory. Bye. <laughs>